morning. How many of y'all believe the Word of God? Uh, you really believe it? How many got a Bible with you? A phone. That's okay. Phone or iPad or Bible. We're going to talk today about how is the Bible reliable? Because when it comes down to it, that's the quest of the day that everybody's fighting. For you see, if the Bible's not reliable, it doesn't matter what we do. If there is no foundation, we're in quicksand dying. If there is no cultural foundation, there's no way to go, no plumb line to follow. And so we want to talk today about how reliable is the Bible. I want you to know it's, it's, it's more reliable than anything else. It used to be that you could keep the word of the handshake. That day's gone. Now you've got to have 14 lawyers and this and that, and it still may not be done. But the Word of God is more reliable, more current than tomorrow's newspaper. And so today, let's look at what the Bible says about itself. In uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, the Bible says, The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the Word of our God remains forever. The, the, the grass withers, and the flowers fade, but the word of our God remains forever. That, that living Logos eternal. It doesn't go away. It's, it's our foundation. It's the eternal word of God that gives our direction, our cultural communication. And so this time of year is easy to see grass withering. It's easy to see flowers fading away. I uh, recently planted some wildflowers. Uh, and boy, are they wild. Uh, they just are uncontrollable. I don't know if it's flowers or weeds, but I got something in there. And they're all growing. Have you noticed how weeds always grow faster than flowers or plants? Uh, the ladies next to us have a garden. And I've not seen them in that garden recently. And so now you've got all kind of green stuff growing up in the garden. I don't know what is mint and julep, what is green beans, what is uh, uh, sassafras. I don't know what's over there. But I'll tell you one thing. The Bible says the grass withers. And the flowers fade, but the word of our God remains true. I don't trim. I'm the kind of guy that cuts the grass, don't trim. But I got spray. I got weed killer that I buy at a place called L Lowe's. And, and I, I, I spray that stuff all over. And before about, about you know, it says three hours rain. When it rains in three hours, it's okay. So I looked today and all the stuff I sprayed was turning brown and dying. And some of got on my flowers I planted, and they're dying too. But I know one thing, if you look out here today and you don't water your plants, you don't water your flowers, in this sun, this heat, they will wither and die. But the Word of God remains forever. In other words, it was true in 400 A.D. It's true in 2017 A.D. It hasn't been disproven, hasn't been proved to be false. It still stands. It's still great. Now, Luke 21, 33 says, Heaven and earth will pass away, and my words will never pass away. Now, Jesus there is talking. If you look at Revelation, we talked about this morning, Revelation. This earth will pass away. This earth will be gone. It's going to be a new earth made by Christ in heaven and earth. And so that will change, but the Word of God is still eternal. The Logos is still eternal. It's still working like it's supposed to. Now, 1 Peter 1, 22-25 says, By obedience, everybody say obedience. obedience. By obedience to the truth, having purified, say purified, purified, yourselves for sincere love of the brothers, sincere love, real love, genuine love of the brothers, love one another earnestly, from a pure heart since you have been born again. In other words, because we're born again and we're saved, we're Christians, some things follow our life. And that's what he's talking about. Born again is the beginning, and then you have obedience and purification, sincere love for each other, and earnest, earnest, pure heart. Born again, not a perishable seed. We're not born again a perishable seed, something that can die. We're born again with imperishable seed. What is that? The Word of God. The Logos, okay? But imperishable through the living and eternal Word of God. Now, pick up your Bible if you want to at some point this week, and you look at any verse in six, six books. Any verse in six, six books, from Genesis to, to Revelation. And that verse will apply to your life. It's a living, working article that's not just a book of theory. It's a book of practicality, a book of living logos that will help your life wherever you are. So, go to Ezekiel. Go to Mark. 
Go to Revelation. Go to John. Go to Exodus. Wherever you go to, it will help your life. Go to Hezekiah. If you find Hezekiah, let me know. It's not in there. But you go to any of the 66 books in the Bible, it will speak to your life and help you. This is kind of a really great thing that happens there. For all flesh, all flesh is like grass. And all its glory like a flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Have you noticed that flesh is temporary? You say, well, I don't know, I've had some flesh for quite a while. I have too. And flesh will increase. That's a joke, by the way. Y'all can smile this morning. <laughs> you lost your best friend. Uh, flesh, flesh does increase many times, right? Yep. I mean, I don't weigh now. I weighed in high school. I don't weigh as much as I did weigh, but I weigh more than I weighed in high school. I weighed 160 pounds in high school. I won't ask how much you weighed in high school. We all know what I'm talking about. We change, right? Flesh changes. Flesh does not usually evaporate. It, it, it collaborates. <laughs> it kind of, it just, it hangs in there. I mean, come on, let's think about it. Aren't you heavier now? Maybe you're not. Maybe y'all have, have gone on a strength process and exercise and you're a runner or whatever. And that's great. But I am not a runner. I'm not even already a walker. <laughs> but I won't. Hello there. So what I want you to know is that flesh accumulates and flesh drags us down. So the Spirit of God, the Bible says in Galatians, is always fighting against the flesh. The Spirit wars against the flesh like all in water, okay? And so it says here, for all flesh, everybody say all flesh, all is like grass. And all of its glory like a flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now, I had some um, petunias on the front porch I bought at uh, Central Hart High School. They've got an agricultural place there at the Ag Department. You can buy flowers. I bought some uh, last year. And I planted them on the front porch, and they were great. They bloomed out well, and they, they looked pretty. And then they, the fall came, they died. And I thought, well, it's a annual. It's, that's okay. I'll get some more next year. Well, this year they popped up again. And I thought, where, where have y'all been? You know, they popped up again. They started getting pretty. I thought, well, what's up with that? It's supposed to be an annual. Maybe nobody told the flower, but it's supposed to be an annual. It's not supposed to come up every year. Sometimes they do. But you know what that flower needed? A little encouragement. A little water. Mine's a story about Texas, uh, out on the Texas highway. It was just, have you ever been in Texas? It was just summertime. When I arrived in Texas in August of 1977, I had never been in Texas. I thought I had arrived in Hades. It was hot and dry, and what they call a tree was a bush in Kentucky. It was, you know, so, so it was really hot. And in Texas, they had this highway, and it was just barren looking. Barren. I say barren. And it rained. And all of a sudden, bluebells came up. Bluebells are special in Texas. And you see, the bluebells were always there. They just need a little encouragement to grow. Most people need a little encouragement to grow. They have a lot of potential, a lot of talent. Needs to encourage them to grow. So it says here, and this is the word that was preached as the gospel to you. So once again, that word of God is 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 made on imperishable seed. It's living and active, and it is a total opposite from our flesh. Now the word of God is living. It's living. Now I want you to take a book of Plato and the Bible. Now, Plato said some wise things, I guess. I'm not a big follower of Plato, but he wrote a book. And people wrote down Plato and wrote what he said. And his, he said, well, they said, well, he has truth, he has wisdom. And nobody denies the reliability of Plato. Teach him in school, teach him in seminars, and they say nobody denies the reliability of Plato. Do you know we have fewer documents of Plato when we do the Bible? We got more manuscripts from the Bible than we do Plato. And yet people doubt the Bible all the time. Now, Plato may have said some truthful things, but guess what? It wasn't a living word. It wasn't a word that intersects someone's life and will bounce off the page. The Holy Spirit lead us and guide us and help us. So the Word of God is living. The Word of God is powerful. If you can read the Word of God 
And you get to John 3.16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in Him should not be per- shouldn't perish, have everlasting life. That's powerful. If you can receive salvation from reading of the Word of God, that's a powerful, powerful living Word. And then the Word of God is eternal. You're going to sing the Word of God in heaven. Now I go to, he- go to heaven and all of a sudden we stop talking about the Word of God. We know how to act in heaven based on the Word of God. We're going to be like Isaiah when he saw the Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. High and lifted up. Holy. Can y'all say holy this morning? Holy. holy. Say that. Come on like you mean it. Holy. holy. I mean, we need to start being holy and talking about the holy God we serve. You see, people don't know he's alive because we don't act like he's alive. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the Word of God is Jesus. He is the Logos. In the beginning, John wrote in 1 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. So that word, Word, in the New Testament means is the Word Logos. It means concept, expression, living, eternal Jesus. So in the beginning was Jesus. Well, how do you know that? Because the Bible says that He was before anything else. He's eternal. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So Jesus Christ is the eternal Word of God. He's the Logos. He's the creative agent of God. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Now that is the most dangerous message of the 21st century because everybody wants to kind of put Jesus on the same shelf as Buddha, Joseph Smith, all these other people. They were human, imperfect beings. Christ was the only Son of the living God. That makes a difference in the Word of God. Okay? Now, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture. Everybody say all Scripture. All Scripture. Not some Scripture. All Scripture. Is inspired by God. Is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So, what happens with the Word of God? How does the Word of God help us? Well, it says it's profitable. It's good. It, it, it makes us an investment, returns an endowment, returns a revenue. It helps us to grow. And so the Word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's profitable for teaching, didache, teaching. And teaching is not just talking about things. It's teaching with the results. How do you know when a member or a church member or a saved person has been taught. Because they take the Word of God, you see that Word of God apply in their lives. So it's for teaching, for rebuking, correcting someone, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. How do we know how to be righteous? In the Word of God. You just don't find out about righteousness on your own. You don't find out about who Jesus is on your own. You need the Word of God to teach you, to train you in righteousness, the right things of God. And by the way, righteousness, the right things of God, will go against our flesh. Our flesh are not right with God, but His Word and His Spirit is. Now how does mankind receive the Word of God? You ever wonder about that? How do do we get the Word of God? Well, this verse says to us, all Scripture is inspired by God. And it's profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness. So how do we get that Word of God? Well, it says all Scripture is inspired by God through the Holy Spirit. Now, there's three things about the Word of God, how God brings the Word of God to us. You've got revelation. You've got inspiration. You've got illumination. Now, revelation is a message. What God is trying to send to us, the message of God. What God is saying to us, what the message is. For God saw the world, well, God loved us. That's his message. And then, how does he give that word to us? What is his method? Inspiration. The Holy Spirit brought God's word to men who did not write what they wanted to write. Wrote what the inspiration told them to write through their personality. But it was God breathed. That's what inspiration means. God breathed. So revelation is a message. Inspiration is a method. Illumination is the meaning. Illumination is a part of the work of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Well, it means the light goes on. It illumines. The light goes on. You're reading the Word of God. 
where your, where your treasure is, there, there will your heart be also. Matthew 6, 21. What it says on the envelope there. So, so you're a believer. The Holy Spirit lives in you. You're the temple of the Holy God. And you're reading that. And you say, well, okay, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Okay, what does that mean? What treasure? What, what heart? What does that mean? You keep pondering that, for example. Where your treasure is? Well, well God, what's my treasure? And, and where is my treasure at? And, and how do I see my treasure? And how do I apply my treasure? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Well, Lord, where's my heart? Are my heart and my treasure supposed to line up? So I give from my heart, revealing my treasure? What's important to me in my life? That's what should be in the storehouse of my heart. What's important? My priorities. My spiritual priorities. So what you're doing is you're reading this Word of God. You may have to read that Word of God 20 and 30 times. Then all of a sudden you're trying to figure out, well, what does that actually mean? And the Holy Spirit illuminates your mind and heart about the meaning of that. Well, it means that we are to have our treasure that's most important to us and give it to God. In other words, if anything is on our heart besides God, as number one, that's idolatry. And so, God, I want my treasure to be your treasure. I want to have my heart be your heart. So, if my heart and treasure measure out to where it should be, they both should be focused on the Lord. That's what it means. So, when the Holy Spirit reveals that to us, that's illumination. So, people that say, well, I can't understand the Word of God. Number one, are you saved? If you're saved, you have no excuse not to, learn, not to understand the Word of God because, well, you do have an excuse too. You have to read it. A preacher was invited over to a family's house for dinner. And when he left, the wife said, I believe that preacher stole our spoon. Couldn't find the spoon. It was at his plate nowhere. He looked high and low. Could not find the spoon. They said, we can't believe our preacher stole our spoon. Our silver spoon that we've had since Grandma died. And boy, she just carried on and carried on and carried on. Well, finally, the next year, she finally said, well, Pastor Jones, I want to ask you a question. When you came to our house to eat uh, lunch, when you left, we couldn't find our, our spoon. Did you steal it? He said, no, I put it in your Bible. <laughs> oh, ouch. Ouch. Sometimes folks with the biggest Bible and the biggest mouth do the most against the kingdom. Because they turn people off. I've known people carried Criswell Bibles, a 20-pounder, and they beat folks up with it. That's not how we're supposed to be. Or, or they become judgmental, legalistic, and make someone feel less than they are because they're different. Let me tell you what. The more humble you are, the closer to God you are. We don't have to prove how spiritual we are. If we're walking with the Lord in love and humility and grace, we're not perfect by a long shot. But that will be seen in our lives as what Christ would have us be. So, God, through the Holy Spirit... Now, that's supposed to be an arrow, but that's the best I can do with my computer. God, through the Holy Spirit, reveals these things to us. Now, you've got to be saved, first of all, and you've got to have a desire to learn. If you don't want to learn anything and don't want to read the Bible and pray about it, there's a good chance you won't learn anything. But if you have a desire to learn from God, the Holy Spirit will give you that revelation, that message what God's message is. He'll give you the method of learning that through the Word of God. He'll give you the meaning and the light will grow on in your life. 1 Corinthians 2, 10-12 talks about the Holy Spirit illumination. Now God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the Spirit of the man that's in him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who lives, who comes from God. So we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. If you want to have a shock, read Facebook. 
and read from Christians, supposedly Christians, their spirituality on Facebook. I've seen so much of the wildest, weirdest, wrong stuff in the world. And the sad thing is nobody knows what's, what's wrong with it. I have been so proud, I won't say who, there is a lady I know in ministry in our local area that has finally said to her friends on Facebook, don't misuse the name Apostle. Don't call yourself an Apostle. Now he's talk, he's, she's talking to her own denomination. And I agree with that. Sometimes we get caught up in the titles we want. I've been called everything. I mean everything. <laughs> Something I didn't prefer, but I think they'll say, well, now you want to be called preacher or pastor or doctor or reverend? Don't call me reverend, please. I don't prefer that one. I like pastor probably better than anything. Or you can call me Jim. It's okay. You know, if you notice... Christ was known as Jesus, a friend of sinners. He didn't let anything that he had become a barrier to his relationship with other people. When you're talking to someone that may only have a high school education, you don't want to try to, to brag about yourself, but brag on Jesus. Brag on Jesus. I, I'm fortunate to be educated. I, I'm proud of that. I'm happy for, I had the opportunity. But I don't ever want to get to the point where I don't relate. Or I can't talk with somebody. In fact, I really think the more educated you are, the more you realize how uneducated you are. And so the spiritual nature says that we are to seek the Lord and seek the Spirit of God to teach us have him reveal things to us so that that is what we speak. 1 Corinthians 2.13 This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. Explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. Throughout my time as a minister, I've had the opportunity to go and listen to many preachers, many teachers. And some really fine people. Really fine people. And some of the great preachers that I've listened to have been Vance Hebner, Junior Hill, and others like that, that just kind of country boys that impress you with their spirituality, not their academics. Most people you speak to are not academics. They're everyday people. If you notice that Jesus, when he taught and spoke, he spoke in the common language of Koine, a Greek of the day, the common language. Where nobody had to leave anywhere and not know what he said. Get, get the bread, get the fishes, go and sin not. Your sins be forgiven, rise up and walk. He used terminology folks understand. Today's church has to use terminology that people understand. They have to be real and transparent and say to people, listen, don't think that we're different from you. Come in and, and hear the Word of God. Let God deal with your life and change your life and love you beyond measure. And, and God, I want God to help me to reach out to people through love and care and concern and not try to impress somebody except Jesus. Now, 1 Corinthians 2.14 the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. But considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. I had an encounter the other day with a pastor I didn't know. Didn't know him at all. And um, he's braggadocious obnoxious, loud, condescending, judgmental. And I thought, well, there's one thing I'm proud of today. I'm not in his congregation. That turns people off. Because that's what the devil tells him we're like, and that reinforces it. So, so, 
someone that thinks they know it all is a turnoff. I'll be the first to tell you, I don't know it all. I want to know more. I'm on that journey. But I don't know it all. God's not told me everything yet. In fact, I don't think I'll know everything and we'll know everything until we get to heaven. And that's why it's a mystery. That's why it's about faith. That's why we can send somebody a lifeline and tell them to hold on, do not give up, for hope's on its way. Down and trodden people everywhere. Financially, health-wise, marriage-wise, all kind of wise. And they don't need a judgmental attitude. They need a helping hand. They need a loving response, a loving encouragement. The last time I looked, I've not, I've not found the first qualified rock thrower. We're all sinners saved by grace. Thank God for that. So, the person without the Spirit, you can't be saved without the Spirit, does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only by the Spirit. The Jews and Greeks both missed Jesus because they wanted a sign. They wanted a sign, Corinthians tells us. Well, how reliable is the Word of God? Well, how about prophecies? By the way, don't go around calling yourself a prophet. A prophet is right 100% of the time. I don't know anybody like that. In the Old Testament, you had prophets because they were right 100% of the time because God called them to be a prophet. But I don't believe in modern day prophets. Over 2,000 in the Old Testament, 2,000 prophecies show divine origin and they are 100% accurate. Some didn't happen for centuries later, but they're always correct. Absolutely. The prophecies of God are always correct and, and are, are accurate. How about inspiration? Truth from God. That means God breathed. Inspiration comes from God breathed. Pneuma. The Greek word for breath, pneuma. We get pneumonia from that. Remember how God made Adam? He made Adam from the dirt. But if he stopped there, he wouldn't have been Adam. He breathed into his nostrils God's breath. And that's what gave them a taste of God. And before the fall in sin, Adam and Eve both had the presence of God in them and on them. The pneuma, the breath of God that breathes to the Word of God, and the Word of God through the Holy Spirit breathes on us. Breathe on me, Holy Spirit, the song says. Breathe on me. We all need to be breathed on by the Holy Spirit because guess what? Many are dead in the church because they're not seeking the Spirit of God to breathe in their souls. Infallibility. A lot of folks have trouble with that. The Bible is infallible, inerrant. I have no trouble at all with that. In the original manuscripts, the original Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, when it's written by God to the prophets or the writers to man, perfect. Accurate, 100% without error, because the Holy Spirit did. People say, well, I don't agree when Peter says Peter didn't say it. Holy Spirit wrote it through Peter. Amen. Wasn't the word of Peter, it's the word of God. And that makes a big difference. Hebrews 4.12, which we've been studying on Wednesday night, for the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Look what the Word of God does. The Word of God is alive and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It goes deep into the bones, deep in the heart, deep into our lives. And it judges our thoughts and attitudes of our heart. If our attitudes and our thoughts are in disagreement with God's Word, we are wrong. And God is always right. How about some love letters? You like love letters? We've lost the town of writing letters. Every once in a while, when I'm going through things at home, I'll find a letter that our kids wrote to each other or they wrote to us in college or whatever. Cards. Cards. 
every time that I address a card to my wife, like a birthday card, or whatever, I always put it to the queen. And she says to the king, that's me. <laughs> that's just our little thing. And, and, I, and I'll say to her, I love you. And she'll say, I love you too. And I'll say, how much? Now, I've said it for 46 years. And she keeps saying the same thing. A whole bunch. Let me tell you something. You better hold your family close. That's the only ones you can depend on. And husband and wives, you better hold your spouse close. Because it's important that couples are together. Now some people don't have that pleasure because of different things, death and divorce and various things. But I, I know it's lonely when you're by yourself. It's lonely when, when you are a single parent or you don't have a mate. It's lonely. Sad. Hurtful. You know, one of the hardest things in churches is when someone, uh, uh, say, a husband dies and the widow's there. About a week, everybody says, We're praying for you, love you. And then they forget about her because she no longer fits into the marriage pattern. She's no longer invited to the marriage couple's retreats and various things. Sometimes we, we don't mean to. We forget about those situations. The difficult time in a, in, a, in a death situation is not the funeral. It's days after the person's buried. And that person goes back to their home looking at four walls and depressed. Maybe we all send flowers with no special occasion at all. Just because we love somebody. Or a card. Or a phone call. You're never wrong to love. Look what God says. I know everything about you. <laughs> oh man, that's scary. God knows everything about us and loves us anyway. What, Psalms 139.1 He says, I have an amazing hope-filled plan for your life. Jeremiah 29.11 He's got a great plan for us. John 3.18 I gave my own son for you so we could be together. Deuteronomy 3.18 I will always be there for you. I don't care where you are, what you're going through, how deep a black hole you may think you're in, how despondent you are, how hopeless you may feel, how discouraged. God is still there. And finally, Jeremiah 31 3 says, I always have and I always will love you. I always have, I always will love you. How many more ways can I say it? I love you, God. If your son or daughter only contacted you when they were in trouble, how would you feel? If they never just called or came by, no special reason, just want to say, hello, Dad, Mom, love you, care for you. We kind of feel bad with me. And so when you get those phone calls or cards from children, for no reason except they love you, that is so special. So very, very special. You know, see, I forget sometimes that I'm closer to the end than the beginning. I don't think about that, but I think my kids do. <laughs> with smiles I'm just kidding and they'll call and say well they always lower their voice and whisper dad how are you doing and I always say I'm not very well I just can't really get out they check on you you know how you and mom doing well you know we're still kicking but not quite as high you know <laughs> how y'all doing well I'm, I'm okay. we're okay we're just you know we're here in a house, kind of stand out of each other's way. <laughs> now, if you're a married couple a long time, you know what that means. Because you can get in somebody's way before you know it, you know. Christian can be in the kitchen there, and, and I can try to go in there, and she'll say to me, what are you doing? And I say, well, uh, 
guys go in the kitchen and she'll say, why? Because <laughs> what she's doing is she's cleaning up things and I'm going to mess things up. She knows that, you know. I'm a great messer up. I'm not a good cleaner. I'm a good messer up. So anyway, love each other. Now, the Bible is the only book where the author is in love with the reader. I close with this. There was a college where a young man had gone to Christian school, raised a Christian, loved the Lord, and went to a secular college. And he was in philosophy class one day, and the teacher was ridiculing the Bible, making fun of the Bible, calling people ignorant that believe the Bible, and out of touch, all that kind of stuff. And so he said, is there anyone here today who would dare to say they believe the Word of God? So this young man stood up, and the professor began to ridicule him, belittle him, about how ignorant he was for loving God and loving the Word of God. And so he stopped and he said to the young man, do you have anything to say? He said, well, I don't think you'll be reading other people's mail. Because he didn't know the Lord. Anybody that's a Christian knows the importance and the paramount emphasis on the Word of God in our lives. The grass withers, the flower falls away, but the Word of God stands forever. And when any, any time you go to the Word of God, you can count on it for your life. Let's pray. Father God.